Hello, this is your Sunday edition of Collider Mailbag. I am Perry. This is Mark Riley. Riley, how is your weekend going? Well, weekend's great so yeah. far. Yeah, there's a few drinks, some parties, some relaxing, some Christmas tree action. You know, the standard stuff. Okay, yeah, standard stuff like mm. junk it, junk it, junk it. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of cool interviews coming your way super soon. Fighting the good fight, Perry. Always, yeah. always, always celebrating the good movies. That's, that's right. That's what it's all about. Exactly. You guys know what this show is, but just in case you don't, this is the show where we get to take your questions, and we take them from all over the place. Email mailbag at collider.com. We also have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, so post your questions over there. Also, a reminder, we live on the YouTube channel in video format. We are also on the Movie Talk feed of our podcast network, so check us out. Take us with you in the car. Tell mm. your friends about it. Mm. That'd be a really good idea. Yeah. What do you think? Ah, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that now. <laughs> Maybe Subscribe you should save it to Collider. After. Oh, right. <laughs> Uh, I just noticed how festive you are here, too. I'm very festive. I have my. Is that the Strangers one? Yeah. It's Christmas time. It's still here. Yeah, it's Christmas time. So I'm putting that in my yoga. uh, Yoga? Sure. Yoda. My Yoda, uh, whatever this is. Yoda, yoga. Yoda, yoga. I mean. That should should be like a yoga pro. That should be a yoga program for for kids to get into yoga. Can can Yoda do yoga, though? Because he's so tiny. He can do yoga. Yoda can. We've seen him flip around. So he's pretty, you know, he can do that. I mean, Yoda, too. I mean, he, he, he gives a lot of, uh, you know, mythological force stuff and, and, and deep dives into, into being, you know. So Yoda, yoga. We're starting a there new thing, I'm telling we're you. Si- we're starting <laughs> in hot right now. This is a genius idea that this we should have heard great. and done something with. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, before we go down the uh, Yoda Yoga trail even further, this first email today is from Steve Calderon, who writes... Could Into the Spider-Verse worked as a live action film too? Maybe part of the MCU with Tom Holland's Spider-Man since Homecoming hinted that Miles Morales exists in that universe or is it just better off as an animated film? Would it be interesting to see live action versions of Spider-Ham and other multiple dimension Spider-Man characters come to life? Ooh, it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think, though, part of the charm of Spider-Verse is the, the animation style. It is unlike anything I've seen in, a, in an animated movie. It really, that comic book comes to life. And so then when you think live action, you think of the characters, in particular Spider-Ham, it's hard for me to wrap my head around a, a Spider-Ham live action. I mean, sure, it could be done. We've seen many things jump to life live action wise. Uh, but. The intention with Spider-Verse, I think, was to really push the boundaries of animation mm-hmm. or do something different, show the comic book coming to life. So I think the story that we have in Spider-Verse works better animated. That's just me. That's my opinion. Now, of course, I was thinking, too, with some of the Easter eggs out there uh, in the movie, I won't spoil it, but I couldn't help but think of, like, what would a live-action Miles Morales movie look yeah. like? That I can, I can get behind. Um, Spider-Man noir, I can get behind. That's an interesting look. We're getting a stealth suit that kind of noirish in Far From Home. So, uh, you know, but I, I think right now, enjoy Spider-Verse for what it is. And live action Spidey, I can't wait to see them continue to introduce some of the, the big villains that we've al- always wanted to see. We're getting a Mysterio. I would love to see Craven the Hunter sooner or later mm-hmm. take on Spidey. I would love to see Venom and Spidey finally go head to head sooner or later. I think that will happen, but... Yeah, your thoughts. I think I'm on the same page as you. I yeah. think there is a ton of story potential and creative potential in this idea of the multiverse and all these different spider people out there. Sure. But like you said, the, the charm of Into the Spider-Verse is that animation style. And also animation gives you the ability to do certain things that you can't do live action. So it's like, let's say we didn't have this Spider-Verse animated movie and everything else was the same and they did it live action. It, it would lose some of this. I, I want to call it unprecedented charm, too, yes. because I've never I've never seen something quite like that. And I've never felt that way. I mean, I love a lot of Spider-Man movies. I especially love Sam Raimi's first movie and Homecoming. But this was different. This evoked a different feeling that yeah. I didn't know that I was capable of feeling as it pertains to Spider-Man and mm-hmm. just all the possibilities out there and how the different interpretations of a Spider-Man can range across multiple animation styles and different personalities. Yep. 
I don't know. I have a feeling, if anything, what we're going to see from Spider-Verse is studios going the other way. Rather than saying, how can we milk this idea for all it's worth and make it live action? Mm -hmm. It's going to be other studios looking in and saying, how can we do what they just did? Exactly. And that's what we, we answered a question on this very kind of idea taking what Spider-Verse did so well, pushing the limits and, and the boundaries of animation, making that jump from comic book to screen that makes it look like comic book coming to life. You could do that with some of the DC properties. You could do that with some of the you know, different comic books out there. You could do that in any kind of case with any kind of IP. Um, that might translate. I would I love to see idea. it. What? So, you know how we're saying you can't you can't do all of this in live action. Right. What if one of the multiverses was live action? You, and that's how you started to loop it all together. I mean, again, we're talking about different studios and Mar Marvel as in Disney Marvel was not involved in this movie. So I'm sure there's some creative issues, but where they're not, unless they talked about it, they're not gonna introduce it into the MCU or anything like that. But if you wanna somehow incorporate Tom Holland's Spider-Man or even Venom or, or something, there must be a multiverse connection where I feel like it could be like a fun button at the end of it. Like, uh, uh, not, le not really Lego, because Lego is throughout, but um, yeah. okay, I don't, I don't know if this is still accurate, but you saw Sa Sausage Party, right? Yes. I believe they might have changed the ending of the movie. At the end of the movie, sorry, spoiler for Sausage Party. Eh. Do they go into live action world? Oh, or is that just remember. the cut that I no, saw at South by? They didn't. That's they how it that. ended. Is that all? Yeah. All like the buns and the wieners? They come out into the real world, right. and yeah. They so did, I'm they, thinking about something like that. Now. They did a very similar joke in one of the Treehouse of Horror episodes in The Simpsons many years ago, where Homer stumbles upon an another dimension, yeah. and they try to rescue him, and then Homer lands in the real world, and it's Homer walking around among the humans, and it's an animated 3D Homer walking around, and it's very cool. I will say, though, that um, the directors did mention that they they believe there's I don't know if it's confirmation. You can find the interview somewhere that they said Tom Holland's MCU Spider-Man is another dimension. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Andrew Garfield, another dimension. Sam Raimi's and Tobey Maguire's really another dimension. Yeah. So that it does kind of link up that way, which I find interesting. And why not? You have different that, dimensions. You can play with that. That's another reason why I love this movie. Yeah. It's because it's a movie that taps into everything Spider-Man, but not in a way where it pokes fun at it in a negative way. Right. It, it embraces and celebrates all the possibilities. It's just about being infused with that kind of tone and style. Yeah. I really think that's why this movie struck such a strong chord with us and it's going to do the same for a lot of people out there. Oh yeah, go check it out. One of my favorites of the year. Next question. Next question comes from Sincere. I love this. It's an email. And Sincere writes, hello Collider crew. The Possession of Hannah Grace came out this weekend, yet another film retreading the same boring themes we've seen countless times before. I love horror, and may be my favorite genre. That's why it's so frustrating that the genre is saturated with ideas that revolve around religious god themes. For non-religious uh, non atheists, stories dealing with possessions, demons, cursed by the gods, and the like are gen generally just silly, funny, or annoying. This is what makes me really appreciate films like A Quiet Place, It Follows, Mama, Train to Busan, Quarantine, Get Out, Oculus, etc. I get why religious related movies continue to be made. It taps into elements relevant to culture where most people are religious, but the issue remains. How do you feel about these overly done religion based Base for Scares films. Any suggestions for more original horror movies? Thanks for being awesome. Thank you. It's it's an interesting question because I understand where the sentiment comes from. I'm not an especially religious person, but I think that's part of the reason why I find these movies so scary because mm. I have no firm understanding of all the details. And I mean, even if I was a religious person, it's not like it's all spelled, spelled out definitively. So sure. the fact that there's so many possibilities out there, that's, that's what gives me like the mind F-U-C-K, where I start to see these things happen on the big screen and I'm like, oh, you know, 
I don't know, if I do something bad, like walk under a ladder or lie or, or think about, you know, a demon or say the demon's name, I'm, right. I'm going to end up uh, being uh, possessed, possessed, maybe. Yeah, mm. exactly. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. It's already been on this question. But I feel like it, it winds up scaring me for that reason. And I think that kind of this kind of reaction to this specific type of horror movie is just the beauty of horror in general is we can all enjoy any kind of horror movie out there. But the truth of the matter is each one of us individually is especially scared of something different. Yeah. And that's why certain movies get a bigger reaction out of me than others. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't look at the, the, you know, the possession of Hannah Grace and the retreading of the same kind of idea of possession. And look, it, it's a, it's a trope in horror. It, mm -hmm. It's something that they, that they go to. And even the nun, you know, we look at that. That's, I guess you could call that a religious kind of background. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it really comes down to the execution and, you know, the possession of Hannah Grace just seemed like another kind of, like, I didn't even know this movie was coming out. This thing could like all of a sudden it's Christmas time and we're getting holiday themed movies and we're getting, you know, Oscar movies and, you know, the big blockbusters are coming out. And then this thing comes out of nowhere and you're like, where were you around Halloween time where it might've landed mm -hmm. better with audiences? I was way more into it when it was called Cadaver. Not that the, not that the title should determine how I feel about the overall quality of a movie, but the second they changed it to the possession of Hannah Grace, mm -hmm. that that, that title didn't really work for me at all, just in general, in terms of catching my eye. But also, when you watch it, it reminded me so much of The Autopsy of Jane Doe, uh, which yeah. is already a great movie. That's and then, one of my favorite horror movies. The more I think about that movie, I love so, it so, so much. It's so, good. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. I watched it quite a few times last year. I want to see it again now. Bye, Riley. I'm going to go see it now. Uh, uh, we were talking about something similar on The Witching Hour, too, just in terms of, like, let's say you are a religious individual and you see a certain interpretation of that in a horror movie and it doesn't line up to what you believe to be true, mm -hmm. that that can then be frustrating. Sure. Which I think is another interesting angle to incorporating something that could be true to someone on the big screen. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, your results may vary when it comes mm -hmm. to horror. What scares you? What doesn't? You know, uh, you know, with these type of movies, possession movies, you know, the one that did it the best is The Exorcist. It's of still course. one of my favorites and, and one of the scariest movies of all time. Heavily, heavily with religion, but it also plays with themes, you know. If you watch that movie again, half of that movie is trying to figure out what's wrong with Reagan, and there's absolutely no religious undertones. I mean, there is, there is a version of religion versus technology in that movie. She is being operated on. There is needles going into her. There are big machines trying to take pictures of her brain to find out what's wrong with her and it's only towards the very end at the it, like you know M chris mcneil is is at the end of her rope and mm -hmm. she's like oh i'm going to a priest now because i have nowhere else to go and then it kind of becomes the movie you know what to be you're gonna see more possession movies you're gonna see a lot of those but it's just in the execution again that's what i feel but you mentioned a list of movies that are so original and so great here get out a quiet place it follows mama mm -hmm. train to busan quarantine oculus etc look at all those those are all very different they they have different kind of a, you have a monster movie there you have a ghost movie there you have a zombie movie there you have an outbreak movie there you have a weird crazy like brainwashing movie there you know there are so many things you can play in the horror genre you can take these genres and really play with them and do something different. The possession of Hannah Grace is just, that was probably very easy to make. It was probably very low budgeted and they, they're probably at the end of the day going to make some money, but not a lot because mm -hmm. it, it came out at the absolute wrong time. That's, yeah. that's what I feel. It, it uh, almost feels like they dumped it. I feel like that one kind of came and went already. It, it's not it, part it of did. the conversation anymore. Yeah, I don't know what the budget is and I don't know what it made opening weekend. You're probably better at that than I am, but it, it didn't make very much. It didn't crack the top five. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but, sincere. If you want to dig into this topic, this is a shameless plug, but I really think it's an yeah. interesting conversation. So we had an episode of the witching hour recently where we had a guest on and this guest wrote a, wrote and started a movie called welcome to Mercy, which is put out from IFC Midnight. Full disclosure, I did not love the movie that okay. much, but when I pair having watched that movie with how she explains it, because 
she had she had a, a heavily uh, she had a lot of religious schooling in her background and in these schools she had to watch videos of people going through exorcisms and it's just the way her religious background is infused in this story and and certain ideas that she brings up it's mm-hmm. it's really fascinating and I think if you're looking for a religion based movie that could maybe work for you it's not Welcome to Mercy all on its own but I do think that paired with her her uh, statements about the movie could just be like an interesting case study for you, I guess. Oh, cool. Yeah. I like it. Uh, Kristen Rulin's her name, and she was a delight and very interesting. Very cool. Uh, now we've got an Instagram question from Tristan MWC, who writes, I'm never affected by the idea of any film being rebooted or having a sequel, but shouldn't more moviegoers have issues with studios making sequels rather than a reboot? A reboot doesn't affect an original film in any way, but a sequel literally picks up in the same universe of a film that you really like and may cause you to see the original differently, i.e. Independence Day, Dumb and Dumber, soon to come. Oh, that's not fair. Soon to call them Gladiator. Yeah. Oh, that's true, though. They're big, uh, it's gla- not a guarantee that it's going to ruin the original, though. That's true. It, it, no, not, there's not never a guarantee. A, never a, a guarantee. Little, a little hope. There's a little hope, but uh, I, the sentiment remains for me in that why are you revisiting Gladiator? That is a perfect movie, in my opinion, that kind of has an, uh, a, a, a great character art for Maximus, you know, a, a beautiful ending. Uh, the music, oh, Hans Zimmer's score is so fantastic. It makes me think of him at the very end of the movie, and that music swells. I digress. Um, I, of yeah. Of course, you go down a score tangent. Yeah, I tell. Well, it scores <laughs> and soundtracks all the way. Um, you know, I, it, it, sequ- you know I, I personally prefer, this is just me, I personally, for movies that I love, and it's, let's say they get a sequel, like Dumb and Dumber 2, for instance, I was all for it. Mm-hmm. I was so excited. It didn't come out very well, and but it in no way, and this is just me, affects the original for me. I will always love the original more than anything. What Dumb and Dumber is one of my favorite comedies, so th- the sequel didn't really do it for me. Doesn't affect it. Um, it's the reboots and the remakes that do bu- mm-hmm. bug me. Is because you have that original, and it's you know in most cases with these original movies that come out, and then they want to be rebooted later, is that there there was they successfully captured lightning in a bottle. It affected pop culture, movies, fans, what have you. So they're trying to go in and recreate that. And that's just not gonna happen. And in most cases for me, I more successful sequels than more than successful reboots, if that makes sense, or remakes. Yeah. But it doesn't bother me. I, I, I think that I understand the thinking here is that mm-hmm. you can take these characters that were established in an original movie, make a sequel, and it can affect the characters from the first movie. They could go on a whole different journey, um, learn new things, and or contradict what happened in the, in the original movie. So that's where, uh, for me, I, or I understand this question, but um, I'm yeah, interested no, in your I, thoughts. I get it. There, there's, it's a, a logical statement to make, and mm-hmm. I've definitely had experience with that with the movie that you named, uh, Independence Day Resurgence. Oh, I hated that movie. I'm not so going to say that I don't still endo- enjoy Independence Day, but there are certain things that happen in that movie, especially to certain characters and certain revelations that now when I go back, I, I don't necessarily look at those characters the exact same way, and I don't oh. like the additions made to those characters or what happened to them in Resurgence. So I do think this is a risky run. But as of late, I'm trying to continue to force my mind to be more open to sequels, reboots, you name it. I I really got to thinking about this with uh, with Andy Serkis's Mowgli movie. Okay. And I mean, a couple of of other things that we've seen recently. But It's just this idea of if you have this piece of source material and Jungle Book or anything, Mm -hmm. if you have this piece of source material that was successful and it's a story that many people out there should experience, but maybe someone out there won't gravitate towards it in this specific in this specific form or in this specific way. And by reinterpreting it, you could then broaden the viewership take the chance. I guess what I'm saying is I would rather see filmmakers out there take the chance and take a big swing by bringing existing source material out to a wider viewership than never take that chance at all. Yeah, totally. I'm with you on that. I mean, it it actually goes back to what we were just talking about with Mm Spider-Verse. So this Spider-Verse thing, yeah, you could have that idea. Oh, do we need another Spider-Man origin story? Why do we need another Spider-Man movie? 
they took a really big swing and it paid off. And because of it, now Spider-Man is going to be out there to an even... I mean, I cannot wait for my little cousins to see Into the Spider-Verse. Oh, yeah. They like Spider-Man already, but I think that's going to make them appreciate that character in a whole new way. So I guess I would rather see more failures out there as long as they try and we still have those special successes as well. Yeah, I'm with you on that 100%. I like it. Number four. Number four question coming at you, and it is from an email, Sophia Robles. Is it Robles? Yeah, Yeah. like Paso Robles. I like that. Sorry, I'm always going to my wine tasting adventures. Hello, Perry and friends. This is what Sophia writes. So, sometimes there is a character in a movie from a saga that has potential to be a new favorite because of their charisma and good performance by the actors, but is underutilized in the story or killed off too soon. I've noticed that two times with Amalyn Holdo in uh, Star Wars Episode Eight and with Leta Lestrange on Fantastic Beast Two. So, for you, which character did you feel was underutilized? Keep up the great work. Thank I'll you. agree with uh, Holdo there because yeah. that was a character I mean I'm sure some of you know that I really uh, I really spark to in the uh, Leia Princess of Alderaan book which yeah. is where we get to meet her when she's a lot younger she is fascinating and I think we see shades of that in Last Jedi right. and she obviously has an important impact on that story but they barely scratch the surface about like just with her charisma and what makes her so unique and yeah. I really wouldn't have minded more of her but One of my big answers to this, I don't think this character is utilized in a poor way in Black Panther, but when they killed, uh, spoiler, spoiler, actually, spoiler for a movie that came out this calendar year, I'm going to spoil a big thing for Black Panther right now, Claw, Circus's Claw, just because they had teed him up so much. Leading, yeah. out, you know, casting announcements, teasing him in other MCU films. And yeah, all Age of, of sudden, Ultron, he had a big he's role. Here. And like we were, and I just remember so long of you know speculating about how he's going to factor in and everything. And he did wind up factoring in in a very logical way, an effective way. It's just when he when he was killed, I'm like, oh, like that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think that was a very important step in uh, Michael B. Jordan's journey. Mm-hmm. But yeah. he he was he was just gone. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it didn't affect me like it did for you. I did have that moment, though. It's like, oh, wow, he's gone. Yeah. All right. You know, and I think I was swept up in the story for... It might have also been partially because of the scoreboard. I think we were oh, playing yeah. scoreboard then, and it was one of those things where one of the options of the wild card might be, like, did like yeah. Claw die? Yeah, that's probably like, true. No way. That'll get in the way of, uh, of our movies any day of the week when you're trying to <laughs> keep that's score on certain things. <laughs> But yeah, that didn't bother me that much. Um, You know, Holdo, I mean, well, she made quite the impact on the First Order, though, huh? Ha ha. Anyways, uh, yeah, I wish I wanted more for her. But this question, there was a character in the Star Wars saga that jumped out at me uh, after talking to my Rule of Two co-host, Mark Fernandez. He's Mm -hmm. like, well, duh. And that's Darth Maul. Darth Maul made one of the biggest impacts in Star Wars fandom. The minute you saw him in that Mm -hmm. first trailer for Phantom Menace, everybody went... That's the Darth Vader of the new trilogy, the prequels. And we were so excited. And then he was cut in half and killed. And so what happens there? People lose their mind. We get the prequels. It moves on. And then what do you know? The Clone Wars comes around and they resurrect Darth Maul. And that's because he was such a popular character. Mm -hmm. I would go back. If I had a do-over, I would have made Darth Maul the villain, a la the Darth Vader or the presence, the Sith that is against our Jedi, he would have been the whole, mo- the whole three movies. Uh, you could expand his character a little bit more. I know we got the great character that we saw all the way through uh, Rebels, and then again, he popped up in Solo. Sorry, spoiling lots of movies this year, everybody, but we did warn you. Um, I, I think that that's an after effect of underutilizing a character where fans go, hey, yeah. and then Lucasfilm listened, and they went, oh, maybe we should bring Maul back, and then he got very popular, and then it's like, hey, look at this, we're putting him in solo. So you learned your lesson. However, that do-over, Darth Maul being the main baddie that you see, not the Emperor, he's pulling the strings until the very end there, but that would have been great to see Darth Maul really, like, he ki- like God, can you imagine? He kills Qui-Gon Jinn. <laughs> Right? Sets up the Obi-Wan feud, and then he's killed. So Obi-Wan gets the revenge right there. But, like, what if that played over three movies? 
and Obi-Wan had to deal with this Sith out there that killed his master and that he has to battle that. He's a Jedi. What does that do to his character? All the while the Republic's crumbling around them and Darth Maul's running around being, you know, twirling his saber and everything. The what, the what ifs. Yeah, the what ifs. The what ifs can hurt. I just got all heated. They Damn. Can, they can hurt. Yeah. We, we did have a great conversation. So when we were programming Mailbag, mm. we were all basically sitting together. And this question in particular wound up going around the office. And yeah. one of the ones that Nose pointed out, I really love Brian Cranston in Godzilla. Yeah. I think that was a character that should have been part of the entire movie. Yes. Another that, recent example. Um, did you ever see Strangers Pray at Night? No, I need to see it. Semi-spoiler yeah. for that movie, Christina Hendricks is way underutilized in that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I could I could even go so far as to I I'm I'm not a big you know bang the drum on this one, but I would have loved more Snoke action in Episode Nine, even though I loved the treatment of Episode Eight because mm -hmm. I think it served the story better than my own fandom wish of seeing and getting every answer for Snoke. That was purely for Kylo Ren's arc, and I love it so much. However, I can jump into some of the comments and go, sure, more Snoke, get all the, the backstory, where did he come from? Mm -hmm. Um, so underutilized, a tad maybe, but that I think there's a bigger story with Kylo Ren there, and we'll get some answers with Snoke later on. I mean, on. there is a big difference between underutilized and underutilized and wanting more. Yeah. So it's like sometimes I'll name someone in this capacity and the fact that I'm naming them at all is just a sign of maybe not necessarily them being underutilized in that specific story, but them striking such a strong chord that I just wanted more of them. Yeah, I get eh. that. Uh, one more question today. That's it. Uno mas. All right. Facebook question from Isaac Jackson, who writes, hey, Collider Mailbag, if you could cast, oh, I love this one, your yeah. favorite Christmas movie with the crew of Collider, who would they play and what role would you cast yourself in and why? Oh, God, I'm going to call myself out on this one. Yes, please. Yeah. I'm Clark Griswold in Christmas Vacation. Oh, I could see that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you would have been privy to the week I had with my Christmas tree and the debacle therein, um, you oh, would have no. seen... Clark W. Griswold in action. My fiance even called me, okay, Clark, because I was decorating, I, I was putting lights up everywhere, I literally pulled lights out and I was like, oh, here's a little knot here, and getting it all out, putting it all up, just taking like expert time with it, and then doing the Christmas tree, the Christmas tree fell over. It literally fell over because we didn't put it in properly, and like tons of ornaments were shattered everywhere and I had a pure honest to goodness Clark W. Griswold meltdown oh, no. when I watched and walked in and saw my Christmas tree on the ground I literally did the lying floor flushing no good son of, a, <laughs> son of a bitch where's the Tylenol I lost my mind, so it is very huh. easy for me I to cast myself. I can't see you losing your mind like that, but oh, it's like talk to Julie if someone's sometime. Christmas tree falls over. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was it was a yours. damn shame, and we had to put the tree back up. Oh. We had to clean up all the ornaments. We had to put them in a bag, and then we redecorated the tree. But as my fiance rightly pointed out, she said, "Hey, we get a two for one Christmas." And oh, I'm like, that's like such a nice uh, silver lining. It was a great silver lining. We decorated the tree again. But as far as casting. The Collider crew, hmm, uh -oh. that's going to be tough. Uh, let's see. God, I don't know. You, I'm going to think about this. You okay. go because I did my tangent on Clark. So the movie I settled on is one of my favorite holiday movies ever. It's Home Alone. Oh, so yeah. So I, the, the one place for Home Alone casting that I started with is uh, the Wet Bandits. Uh huh. And who who would be the kind of guy in this office that that would do something along those lines? And I got to point a finger at Jeff Snyder. I was gonna say and Snyder. Then, and then so I'm picturing. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say Snyder. I'm picturing uh, Snyder in the the Harry role. Yeah. And then I was trying to think like one who would he kind of look like if I'm doing a Harry Marv pair here? And uh -huh. then who would it be funny to hear uh, Jeff go back and forth with? And I had to pick Jack. Jack, like that's if funny. Jeff and Jack were Harry and Marv. Yeah, I, I could see the Wet Bandits being Roka and Snyder just based on their that comments over the too. table. I cast over their Roka desks. as well. Do you know where I cast Roka? In Home Alone? Yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, let me think. Um, 
Is he the brother? I cast him as uh, Old Man Marley. Old Man Marley. Okay, I, can, I like that. Could you see like Grumpy Roca just shoveling the sidewalk outside? Yeah, I could. I could. <laughs> but then, then you see his really tough exterior, and you're scared of him. And then you sit down and talk to him, and you realize he's actually just a sweetheart. Absolutely. I'm pretty sure that's Roca. Yeah. I had to cast Buzz, of course, and that pretty much just came down to, like, who could give like the sassiest one-liners here? Christian. Cobster. Cobster. Yeah. Oh, I like that. I feel like Cobster would nail that. Yeah. And then there's Kevin, of course. Kevin. So the way I started to picture this was what happens if someone was locked in the Collider studio and the rest of us just like took off and forgot that person. Okay. And I think the person who would have the most fun in that scenario is Mark Ellis. Yes. It's just... He would be a kid on Christmas morning to have free reign in the studio to make whatever he wanted. Mm -hmm. But then the question was also about casting myself. So I think Ellis is mostly Kevin, but I get a little piece of Kevin because I'm the only jerk that would go into a store and ask if a toothbrush, it was, if it was approved by the American Dental Association. Yes. I'm terrified of the dentist. I was going to say that when you brought that up, I'm like, well, you're Kevin, obviously. Yeah. So um, as far as casting out the rest of my... Cousin Eddie is is the most um, you know iconic when it comes to Christmas vacation, and there is nobody in the Collider offices that are like that kind of dim witted. So I don't want to make this. What a this, nice thing to say. It, I mean, he's he, come on. It's like Cousin Eddie is he's kind of a kind of a, a, a adult sometimes, but somebody that could play him. I, I just picture Josh McCuga. Josh McCuga and me doing that scene. We quote Christmas Vacation all the time, me and McCuga. So I, I could see him doing a fantastic Cousin Eddie. I feel like McCuga would be good in almost any, like, like happy, goofy Christmas movie. Yep. and uh, I he would, would be a good wet bandit, too. Yeah, he would. And I would cast you as Cousin Eddie's wife, who is so nice and sweet. And But then she puts the turkey out there. And this is only this is coming from somebody that was microwaving eggs at one Guilty. point. Guilty. And the turkey's dry. I could picture it breaking open. And Perry goes, sorry. <laughs> That's yeah. why I never cook anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, No, very, very fair one there. Um, but, but just as far as being able to play it based on personality, then I would cast mark ellis is the friend of clark's okay. at work because they're like what are you doing for the holiday he's like that kind of guy um the the wife i would have to bring i would have to hire my fiance to come in beverly d'angelo to work here to cast her because her reactions to me with the christmas tree are exactly what she did in the movie so as then russ would have to be cody i love Obviously. like russ and then right here dad oh there you are that's Cody. Um, I feel like, God, there's so many parts in this. The 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 the, the in-laws that are there, Clark's dad. Uh, I almost wish we could play this game the entire mailbag, and it could be every single different movie because I started to want to cast so many. I'm casting everybody. I mean, Clark's dad. I mean, who could be like a father figure to me that gives me advice and is very calm. Ken Napsok, I think, is that's is somebody that's perfect. Like he's like, I'm going in with them when they're going after the squirrel. Uh, God, there's so many. Who else is out there? Uh, Russ, and then Audrey would, I guess, be Wendy because uh, Wendy, I could see her being like, I don't like this Christmas stuff here. You know, <laughs> like let's get in motion here. And then the in-laws. Uh, oh God, I, I I don't got it. I don't I don't know who else. But I really could go on and on. About I could this. go on and on. This is just gonna keep going. So I'll uh, stop there. That was. You you so cast much the fun. rest. You cast the rest. If you know Christmas Vacation, put it you section. put it in the comment section. Help me out here. Thank you for that fun question, Isaac. That yeah. was a great way to cap off the episode and to cap off this weekend of Mailbag. Yes. That's it. It's That's over it. and done with. That's I have to thank wrote. all of you for sending in these great questions, for supporting the show, for liking and sharing it, and for tuning in next week when we have even more Mailbag. And Mailbag is not stopping. Just because the holidays are coming up, too, does not mean we take off. We have new episodes for you and... You might see maybe a holiday theme one, maybe a best of the year one coming your way real soon. So keep an eye out for those. Mark Riley, thank yeah. you for joining me. My pleasure. Happy to be here as always. Those were fun. I hope you guys had fun too. Goodbye. We're out of here, but we will see you live tomorrow, 4 p.m. PT for a brand new episode of Movie Talk. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.